Good evening, grave robbers. Oh god, I can't do this. I can't... I can't act like this is normal. With what we've seen tonight. Just giving up immediately? Oh. With me as always is TV is Noah Houlihan. Jellicle cats, jellicle cats, jellicle. The jellicle cats are a jellicle. Jellicle. It's so, not a word. So, jellicle isn't a word. So, I, I know we said we were going to watch the chatterbox from the nanny, but cats came out this week, kids. And Guys, cats came out. And once the reviews came out, no one I realized something. This is going to get nominated for a Razzie. Yeah. And we are going to have to watch it someday. Yes. And then this morning, this is Sunday. Yes, happy Sunday. When we're recording this. And this morning, the news broke that they are rushing a new cut into theaters. Yes, because apparently the cut that is currently in theaters is incomplete. So, it is in fact doomed. Yes. So, they they had to fix some of the CGI in post-release, which is uh, not a common thing to do. So we wanted to see it before they fixed it. Yes. And see if it should be fixed or if we'll fix. I don't know if it's good enough to stay on its own or if it should just stay doomed. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything anymore. <laughs> yeah, this is our I, this is going to be clearly our first Razzie episode. The nominations won't be out till the end of January, but uh, the crystal ball in front of us. <laughs> if there's ever been a safe bet. So this is like the first ever, like, breaking news episode of Stay Doomed? This is also, uh, we've talked about doing this for a while. This is our first ever immediate postmortem. Yeah. It's a little later at night than we usually record. Yeah, so um, we're silly. <laughs> we, I mean, we just saw cats. It doesn't matter what time of day we saw it. Mm-hmm. <sighs> All right. <laughs> so I think here's an interesting thing I'd like to start with. Right. Uh, let's start with the trailers. Because this is something I found very interesting. Oh, the trailers that aired before the movie, not the Cats trailers. Yeah, okay. before the movie. Because these are, are things that, you know, pe- you would think that people seeing this movie would also be interested in. Makes sense. So we started with the Aretha Franklin movie. Yes, which, which also stars Jennifer Hudson. Yeah, which makes perfectly sense. Perfectly makes sense. And like, I didn't even know that movie was coming out. So interesting. Cool. Then we got like In the Heights. Which is another high-profile musical theater trailer, and also make sense to air. Plus, they want to remind you what it's like to feel things, because you're not going to know how to feel anything anymore. Right. Then we got some weird movie, uh, I Still Believe or something. Yeah, it's um, Archie from Riverdale. Yes. He is a Christian folk singer, rock singer. I can't really tell what genre they were attempting to make. Uh, Whose fiancé has cancer? Yeah, something something weird, and we're like, oh, okay. She is pretty romance movie disease. Yeah. The disease that every love interest in a romantic movie gets, where mm-hmm. she's like, never loses her hair, never gets any less beautiful. It's whatever uh, Jen had in Dawson's Creek. Yes, exactly. And then, Sonic the Hedgehog. I died, guys. I was like, oh, they think furries are here. Yep. So they want to be like, yo, if you haven't heard, Sonic the Hedgehog is coming to theaters. Do you know what the other two trailers we had were? Well, then we got... Call of the Wild. Oh, I forgot about Call of the Wild. Which is another CGI animal movie, because the character of Buck is clearly CGI. Yes. And Dr. Doolittle. Well, you're forgetting a big one. Oh, you're I was forgetting. going on the talking animal train. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we do get Dr. Doolittle. Those were the two... Buck doesn't talk, but he's also a CGI animal. Mm-hmm. But then we also got that Trolls trailer. I choose to forget. I honestly thought they were showing that right before the movie to be like, look, a worse movie. It looks bad. It, like, it doesn't look like a real film. No. It is the story of... I'm going to just explain it to you. Watch the Trolls trailer. Maybe I'll stick it in here because it's it's absolute insanity. <laughs> I'm Queen Barb of the Hard Rock Trolls. I'm here to take your string, bro. Ooh, don't do it, man. We lose our string, we lose our music. I'm gonna unite the six strings and destroy all music. Except for rock! It looks abysmal. It's, it's tough. And now I've delayed as long as I could. And we have to talk about cats. Y'all. 
Uh, I'm going to start by saying I enjoyed this movie for all of the wrong reasons. Yes. Uh, I had a great time. I have to also make a confession. Yeah. Um, I'm a theater dweeb of a certain age. Right. And kids, you have to understand. When when I was young, we didn't have Hamilton. We didn't have Dear Evan Hansen. We didn't have Heathers. We didn't have any of the things you enjoy now. Musicals aimed at younger audiences that are not terrible. Mm -hmm. We had Rent. And we had cats. And if you were a Broadway fan on the internet in eh, 1999, 2000, that's all you had. And you had like Les Mis and Phantom had a fringe uh, group too. But uh, I used to really love cats when I was little. Yeah. I owned the 1998 VHS and watched it pretty faithfully. Like, Mm. you know, once every couple weeks I'd put it on. Uh, It's becoming clear how many of the words I remember. Yeah. And how much of the plot I remember. And I also want to say that I had Noah watch the numbers Magic Mr. Mistopheles and Rum Tum Tugger from the 1998 video before we started this. Because I needed him to see certain things. Yeah, to understand some stuff. Uh, And I will say that I am a theater kid. uh, But, like, I don't actively seek out musicals. That doesn't mean I don't like them. Like, I was in a few and, like... Really enjoyed Hamilton. I really enjoyed Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh, I was really big into Bat Boy. Like, this isn't going to be two people who hate musicals ripping this thing. No, apart. I've seen easily upwards of 50 shows. Yeah. I love musical theater. And I was one of I was one of those kids. Yes. And you were one of those kids. Yes. Yeah. So now. Let's talk about how this infuriating movie. We open on a cat in a pillowcase being thrown in an alley. Yeah. So one of the things that's weird is something we never really see in the musical is we see part of a human being. Yeah. We see a woman's feet Mm -hmm. as she gets out of a car and she is clearly holding a prop pillowcase with like a stuffy in it Mm -hmm. and then the next time she yeets the pillowcase and then it's a clearly different shape because now we have a character inside it played by a human being yes yes so we have nanny from muppet babies tossing a cat (laughs) into an alley in a pillowcase which is weird even to start with because you'd think you would just open the car door and let the cat out if you were gonna do that yeet him yep but i guess that would have also been harder to film yeah very true. And this cat is Victoria. Yes. Uh, if you if you're familiar with cats, Victoria is a pure white cat traditionally, and uh, traditionally the strongest dancer. Yes. She has a couple. She has at least one solo, usually a couple solos, usually uh, very flexible, very gifted, and the fandom always pairs her with Mistopheles. Yes. That's important. We'll talk about it more later. All right. So she dances out of this bag. And then she's surrounded by all these other cats that are asking her if she's a cat by saying qualities about cats. Like, were you born blind? Can you see in the dark? Would you sit on a king's throne? (laughs) Are you cock of the walk when you're walking alone? What a weird way, like, I don't, I'm going to curse a lot this episode. I'm going to let you guys know right now. But, I don't give a fuck about any of these characters right now. Because I don't know what the fuck is going on. And we're opening with all these cats antagonizing this other cat that I don't know. Like we get, We're given no names. And we just break into this number that's not even really music in the beginning. Right. <laughs> this is important to note. Noah, do you know the, what Cats is based on? I believe it's a poem. A book of poetry, yes. Okay. Uh, Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats. There might be a copy of it in this house. Oh. Um, by T.S. Eliot. Okay. Uh, because I studied Eliot in grad school, so I'm not... I also did just own a copy when I was a kid. Uh, So every song, with few exceptions, is 
almost word for word taken from uh, T.S. Eliot's Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats. Mm -hmm. He is actually usually credited as a lyricist in this show. Okay. Because with very few small changes, uh, most of the poems are just presented to music. Okay. That being said, the feeling I got from this opening song was there's no introduction to anything. It kind of felt like you went in and the show already expected you to know what it was about. And if you didn't take the time to learn that, we're not helping you come along. To be fair. To be fair. Uh, the musical treats you the exact same way. Yeah, and that turns me off. It like it it only it feels elitist almost. Like like the opening number is if you don't get it, you're stupid. Like that's how I felt during that beginning part. Okay. In this musical number, they start dancing in the street in front of cat puns. Yes. But not good ones. <laughs> No, like, they're supposed to be in London. And it's, like, ads for Agatha Christie's The Mousetrap. Right. Like, any cat pun they can figure out. They're also in front of a cat -sino, Yes. And also something called K-9. Mm-hmm. Which is a dog pun. Yes. Remember that. <laughs> There's also a milk bar. Yes. Like, it's friggin' clockwork orange up in here. Ugh. So, uh, I'm actually, since I didn't take notes on the movie because I didn't want to haul a notebook mm -hmm. in, I didn't want to be that person. Yeah. Uh, plus, I also kind of wanted, since we can't rewind this and watch it again, Yeah. I wanted to really watch it. Sometimes I miss things when I'm taking yeah. notes. Yeah. So, I'm going back and forth between, uh, Cats is sung through. Right. So I have the track list up for the, uh, both the musical and the film. Okay. So the next thing we see after this quasi opening number. Oh, I have one more thing I have to say about this opening number. Sure. Is in the middle of it, out of nowhere, two break da dancing cats show up wearing sneakers. Yes. And then I was just like, why, why do those cats have shoes? Yes. And none of the other cats have shoes. They're also, like, wearing necklaces. Yeah, like, well, some of them I took, like, are wearing collars and mm -hmm. things like that. But the fact that they're like, these two cats have shoes. doop a doop a doop a doop a dancing And then they're just gone. It felt like they ran out of footage and they were like, Greg, Mike, go dance. Yeah, and, the, I mean, they're wearing necklaces through the thing. Uh, I had the thought of... They felt uncomfortably, like, racially coded. A little. Yeah. Um, I can get that. It reminded me of Transformers. <laughs> yeah! Like, they reminded me of Skids and Mudflap, <laughs> where it felt very much like they were not Cats characters who were being played by people of color. It was them looking around and being like, we need black cats. Yeah. It is also worth noticing that the breakdancers are not in the show. The The musical is clearly trying to add more genres. Yeah. They change the instrumentation of several songs. Um, it's very, very strange. But the breakdancing cats felt very weird. Yeah. And felt very out of place. And it felt like they looked around, realized most of the cast was white, and were like, ooh... Someone's going to get mad at us. Well, the truth of the matter is, like, a ballerina kind of moves like a cat. Right. That's why it makes sense to have someone being like, all right, now this is the breakdancing cat. I've never seen a cat pop and lock. That's not what happens. There's also numbers it would have worked in. Yeah, this was not one of them. Yeah, like, you could put that in the Rum Tum Tugger. Mm -hmm. You could arguably put it in Mr. Mistopheles. Yeah. Uh, it works better in an up-tempo number. Ugh, frustrated. So, like, I just want you to know, we are eight minutes in this movie, and I'm unbelievably frustrated already. <laughs> yeah, like, the breakdancing cats don't feel right. They yeah. feel weirdly pandering. Yeah. Um, In, like, a very uncomfortable way where I'm like, I don't... 
I'm not the authority on whether this is racist, but I feel like this is kind of racist. Mm -hmm. Um, So the next thing is the naming of cats. This number should have been cut. Yeah. A lot. Uh, And it was cut. It's cut down. Okay. It should have been cut out. Yeah, because I don't understand this at all. In the musical, this is just a spoken word poem. They don't okay. really bother to, like, set it to a melody. Mm-hmm. And it's, it doesn't translate on film. The, 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 the name of a cat, every cat has three names. Yes. There's the cat's name that the family gives it. Yeah. Then there's a second name that I don't understand. Yes, because they don't talk about it. And then there's a third name that's like the cat's identity that it doesn't share. Yes. They don't use this the way they're kind of supposed to. I gathered that because I have no idea what the hell any of this is about. Because they cut it down. But most of the named cat, the cats, the cat names that are brought up, for the most part are cats that appear. Um, Plato, Admetus, Electra, Demeter are all people we see later. Mm -hmm. And they mention the cat's names that are particular. They mention five names, and all five are characters that appear in the show. Mm -hmm. Um, Monkastrap, who is the gray cat who is the leader. We see a lot of him. He is never named on screen. No. Uh, So he's Monkastrap. Quaxo, who there's a whole thing with Quaxo that it doesn't apply to the movie. Okay. Um, Quaxo is what a lot of people in the fandom consider Mr. Mistopheles when he's not being the onstage magician. Okay. Like a Superman Clark Kent kind of cat situation. Oh, okay. Yeah, weird. Caricapat is one of the twins. It's the one I called Copernicus in the car. Oh, okay. And Jelly Lorem has been cut from the show. Okay. And then Bombalurina is Taylor Swift's role. All right. Interesting. So that, that's a huge flaw in this film. Is all of these characters have names, but we don't learn any of them. Mm-mm. I didn't learn anything from this movie. So they did cut down the naming of cats, but they should have cut it out entirely. Uh, it's just a weird, creepy spoken word segment that does not work on screen. So then we're, we're kind of, at this point, given what this movie's about... Yes. Which is all the Jellicle cats, which, what the hell's a Jellicle cat? No. It's a cat that's part of this cult? Yes. Uh, they, they join on this day to appeal to, uh, what's it, Demeter? Old Deuteronomy. Old Deuteronomy. Who is named on screen. Old Deuteronomy. Uh, to be the, cho- the Jellicle choice. And will be granted a new life. Uh, which immediately makes me think, oh, this is Logan's run. <laughs> kind of? Yeah. At Carousel. We will, at Cat Rosell, We will choose someone to go up into the sky. <laughs> uh, this is also more, exp- this is the same plot as the musical and more explanation than we receive in the stage musical. You mean there's less explanation in the music, like on the stage musical? Correct. See, this is the thing I'm talking about, where it feels like if you're not going to clue in your audience on your plot, you're kind of setting it up for like you being like, you just don't get it. It's like you're goddamn right because you didn't tell me a goddamn story. Nope. Oh, I'm not gonna not gonna defend mm. this. So then. Mm. Mm. I so, seem happy. As they set up this goddamn Logan Run situation, and then we're like, "All right, we're gonna we're gonna meet our contestants." Yeah, they make it feel like a reality show, which is not intended to be. In yeah. it, it's them. Like, I had this moment during the theater where I was like, "I can't wait to tell Noah they added more plot," because I knew. That you were going to lose it because I knew you were feeling like there is no plot to this. And I was like, ooh, wait till I tell him. And I'm not even done. There's a lot of things they added to try to make the movie make more sense. Uh, So, yeah, we're playing Jellicle Idol. 
Yes. And each person's going to come out and, and sing a little song on why they should be the Jellical choice. Jellical cats, Jellical cats. Who's up first? Oh, it's fucking Rebel Wilson. She is dreadful in this role. So- she is the old Gumby cat, Jenny Any Dots, who in the musical is a fairly charming motherly figure who is kind of... Oh, Noah, please don't spit your tea on the microphone. It's I expensive. almost did. I almost did. Why is there not rum in my drink? <laughs> I didn't make you a hot toddy. I just made you a cup of tea. Um, it's late at night, so I made a cup of hot tea so that we didn't die. Um, she is the kind of cat that makes you a cup of tea. She is this charming, kind of matronly cat, usually played by a slightly older actress. Um, like, Jenny Annie Dots is endearing. I thought it was a Garfield. Like a, I'm just going to lay around in the sun, cat, blah. Nope. I mean, there's still the line, she sits and sits and sits and sits, but the whole thing is that, like, her family thinks of her as an old lazy cat. Mm -hmm. And then when the family goes to bed, she, like, teaches the mice to dance. And, like... So this is a question I had for you. Because in this, she, she has mice that she teaches to dance and then, like... She, but she says, like, it's dinner and a show. Like, I could eat these. Mm-hmm. And then later there are dancing cockroaches. With human faces. With human faces. Some of whom she consumes on screen. Yes. A- any of this in the music? Like, are, do, are we, do we get mice and, and cockroaches in the stage? We show? never see bugs. And, okay. Um, I'm usually using the 1998 movie as my best source because it's the one I remember the best. It's usually, there's a group of actors that are kind mm-hmm. of, like, thought of as the kittens. Yeah. Um, when I showed you the Rum Tum Tugger, all the little young looking girls mm-hmm. around Tugger, uh, those are usually the kittens. So there's a little sequence where they put on mouse ears and they're like pretending to be the mice. Okay. But it's clear they're not mice. They're not different characters. It's they're part of the play. And they're like, mm. if Jenny Annie Dots is auditioning, mm. she is, uh, the cats are helping. Gotcha. So gotcha. they're like, we're wearing little mouse ears and we're cute. Because I was watching this thinking, oh my god, there's going to be someone that now has a resume that says, cats, cockroach. That's got to be the weirdest thing to be on a resume. I was wrong. It's coming up later in this film. <laughs> it also looked like the cockroach was one woman. Yeah, they, they, um, they did the... Uh, Deep Roy. The Willy Wonka... Yeah. <laughs> Deep Roy is the name of the actor. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Willy Wonka's Oompa Loompa, where they just cut him in a bunch of times. Um, uh, so this, this song is abysmal. This is the first time that, for some reason, I'm like, oh, these are just naked. They are technically naked. Also, Rebel Wilson is very, very weirdly physical in this film. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a lot of Rebel Wilson, like... This movie is very uncomfortable. Yeah, she's constantly, like, scratching her inner thighs. She draws a lot of unnecessary attention to her crotch and her butt. Yeah. And it's very, very weird, and it's very unsettling. Uh, uh, she, I don't, I don't think it was her, but I think it may have come up already. Uh, there's a line mm-hmm. where they ask Victoria a question. Yes. And she's kind of, like, frightened uh, in a very cat way. Like, I was kind of, like, invested. Like, ooh, that was very cat-like the way she acted. And then someone says, what's your name? Cat got your tongue? Fuck you. Like, <laughs> that type of humor makes no goddamn sense. To, to, like, yeah, let's throw in a cat pun. That's not, in this universe, they wouldn't use that expression. I used to run a web series. <laughs> Uh, we had this series of web comics mm-hmm. called uh, CSW Comics, and the idea was we were a comic book shop, so we would all tell our own comic book stories. Okay. So there was mine, there was John's, and then John's girlfriend at the time uh, wanted to help us uh, run our forums, and we're like, "Oh, that's awesome!" Now she thought what that meant was she also got to make a comic. Oh, boy. So one day, she sent me this comic, and it was called Mike and Pooch. Okay. And they were these half-man, half-dog creatures. Okay. And the comic was, hey, Mike, 
Look at that bitch over there. Pooch, don't use language like that. It's okay, Mike, we're dogs. That's just the name of a female dog. <laughs> they do the same joke in Cats. It's the same joke where it's just like, we are cats. And I said, cat got your tongue. And they do this joke a few times. Yeah, I was about to say, this is not the most egregious <laughs> version of this problem. <laughs> what are you doing? Did, uh, did anyone look over the script once? Be like, oh. wait, this doesn't make any goddamn sense. No. We're going to come to the conclusion, no. No one ever looked at the script. Ever. Now, we're doing the, like... American Idol version, and in this, usually Jenny Any Dots and Rum Tum Tugger and not so much Buster for Jones, you don't see him as much because he's probably takes off most of his costume to be a regular sized cat okay. for the rest of it. Uh, but we usually do see them through the rest of the sequences. Okay. Uh, so right after Jenny Any Dots' song, she is more or less interrupted mm-hmm. at the very end of her song. By Rum Tum Tugger. Yes. Played by Jason Derulo. Mm-hmm. This song is a thing that happens. I'm kind of... I kind of enjoyed this one. I think Jason Derulo does a pretty good job in this part, yeah. honestly. He, you know, it's... He's basically... He's a sex icon. He's hamming it up cats. as in... Yeah, he's hamming it up. hmm Like... There is not a moment where Jason Derulo is on screen for the whole movie where he's not kind of hamming it up. Yeah, and like, that that fits what this character is supposed to be. I'm all in it, but for some goddamn reason... This is one of the worst sequences in the entire film. They would randomly cut to Reba... Rebel. Rebel. Whatever. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm very angry. Doing what is clearly ad-libbed dialogue. Ooh. Where she's just like, uh, what was one of the lines? You remember, you remember it. Yeah, she is uh, muttering to Munkastrap. She goes, oh, some of those notes he was hitting were awful high. You think he just got neutered? Snip, snip. Mm -hmm. It's about the level of comedy as your friend in the theater who's like, I'm going to say something funny and leaning over to you that you then turn and say, shut up. I paid for these theater tickets. (laughs) I'm yeah. not here to hear your commentary. But no, it's a person interrupting the song. <laughs> and uh, important subtext, because it's not really in the plot. At this point, Victoria seems like she is being actively courted, both by Strap, who's the leader, mm-hmm. who kind of looks like a great value Robert Downey Jr. Like the Walmart mm-hmm. brand. And Mr. Mistopheles. Yes. She, and... So she's into Rum Tum Tugger because mm-hmm. he, you're, all the female cats are into Rum Tum Tugger, mm-hmm. and that's what catalyzes the line. Like the Rum Tum Tugger is a terrible bore, mm-hmm. but it's Mister Mistopheles blatantly begging for her attention, and like mm-hmm. there's a point where I was like, are they gonna make Mister Mistopheles into like a nice guy? The. <laughs> I'll say this now. Okay. What I felt like what was happening was Victoria is an awesome ballerina. Mm-hmm. And Mr. Mistopheles is a magician. And constantly, Victoria is trying to do ballet. And Mr. Mistopheles trying to show someone a magic trick. And every time they're about to do it, something interrupts them. Yeah. There are so many times where Victoria is dancing and like she puts her leg up in the air and another cat will swoop in and actually pick her up and move her away so we cannot be interested by this. So whatever the other thing going on, so we can get another rebel joke or some crap. Yeah. Now, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. Victoria's role is greatly expanded from the musical. Uh, she goes from being... Expanded? From the musical? Yes. Oh my god. She's she's pretty much a lead, if not the lead of the film. Mm-hmm. She is not even a singing character in the musical. Like, she sings in the ensemble pieces, but, mm-hmm. like, she doesn't really have her own solos pretty much anywhere in the show. Mm-hmm. So she... she Folds in several other characters' stuff. Okay. Uh, Because that's important. There's going to be a big point I make about Victoria at the end. Okay. 
So the Rum Tum Tugger happens. There's a fun dance sequence. They're in a milk bar. The milk bar part is weird. It's a little mm. bit, because they're still drink, licking it out of saucers. It's very weird. Weirdly sexually charged is pretty much the th- under theme of this film. Mm. And by under theme, I mean the overt overtone. Everything is just like weirdly horny and at the same time incredibly unappealing. Yeah. Like, the movie is horny, but the movie is not sexy. Yeah, like there's wow, not, what a great description. Like, there's not going to be a point for, I mean, for some people, I'm sure, everybody has a thing. But for a pretty conventional thing, for most of the reviews I've been reading, my own experience, there was never a point where I was like, yeah, I'm into this. It was mostly like, oh, they want they want someone to be into this, but I'm really just uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, there was a moment where I was like, this is a movie I would be horrified to take my children to. Mm-hmm. And this is being marketed as, like, a family film. I, I would like, like to say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Okay. But I enjoyed the Rum Tum Tugger song. I thought it was fun. Mm-hmm. We never see his ass again. Rum Tum Tugger? Is he just gone? No, we see him pretty frequently in the crowd. I, I actually give Jason Derulo a lot of credit. He's in the Magical Mr. Mistopheles number. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm he is singing. singing his own melody line. You right, know, I'm just an idiot. It's fine. Um, he's in the ending. He is in way more of this movie than he needs to be. Oh. Yeah, like I actually... Apologies to Jason Derulo. Yeah, like I was actually like favorably impressed with Jason Derulo's c- commitment to this <laughs> film. And uh, like I've watched him do some of the promotion for this movie. And I was like, dude, you do not have to be that into this. No. Bless mm-hmm. you. Bless you for being this into your weird, weird project. Um, I think he performs well. He's still in a lot of it. He's not one of the characters who disappears. He's still in most of the film. Yeah. Which makes a change they made especially egregious. We'll get to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So next we have Bustopher Jones, The Cat About Town. I did leave the theater momentarily during this, so you're going to have to drive the boat here. This is James Corden. He is utterly charmless. I really like James Corden. Like, oh, I meant in this role, not in general. He, I know that's why I say it. Like, I really like him. I think one of the most amazing roles he was in. He was in um, uh, Ocean's Eight, mm-hmm. and somehow steals the movie. Like, he's fantastic. I quite like him as the baker in Into the Woods. I thought yeah. he did a good job in that role. But like, he's dressed as the cat in the hat. Yeah. And he's just, like, a fat guy who likes eating. And, like, man, I don't think he cares. It's a three-minute fat joke. Uh, this is also important to mention with Rebel Wilson and James Corden. Rebel Wilson was in Pitch Perfect. Right. James Corden was in Into the Woods. Mm-hmm. So these are two people who can sing. Yes, they are choosing not to. <laughs> and they both sound horrible. Mm-hmm. And I'm... uh. I have to look into this a little more. Tom Hooper, who is the director of this film, also directed Les Miserables in 2012. And in that film, he very much prioritized emotion over quality of singing. So he made the actors sing live. Mm -hmm. um, And they're often a little off Mm -hmm. or something's wrong. Mm -hmm. And that comes into this movie a lot, too. A lot of the things I don't like about the way this was adapted are things I also didn't like in the adaptation of Les Miserables. Okay. Which is interesting because that movie was considerably better received in that, like, Anne Hathaway was up for an Oscar for that movie. Right. I I believe she won, actually. I believe she did. I think we had this conversation recently. And she's pretty good in that movie. Les Miserables lends itself to his style a little better than this does because Les Miserables is so much more emotional than this show is. Like, Um, all the cats should be, like, running around playfully instead of, like, being sad that their teeth are gone. And in the Heights, the trailer, I was like, there was so much more as far as, like, beautiful cinematography and imaginative sequences Mm -hmm. in, like, and I've seen In the Heights, and I'm not positive which sequences are going to go with which songs, but the pool sequence looks amazing. Mm -hmm. And some of the other sequences, I was like, This is beautifully shot, and this is beautifully musical theater. Mm -hmm. Because I like shows that are unapologetic about being musicals and are, like, 
a lot of fun. Uh, one of my favorite musical recent scenes is I don't like the Sweeney Todd Tim Burton did, mm. but I really liked By the Sea. Okay. Because it's when he's like, we're going to have fun with this and break the form. And that works really well. This is just... If you're going to cast singers, just let them sing well. Mm. Especially when you have a movie, it's going to become a definitive version of the musical. It's going to. Mm -hmm. Because it's going to be something people can access much more easily. The way the 1998 Cats is fairly definitive because... It didn't matter if you were 11 years old and couldn't get any other copy of it and your mom wasn't going to take you to see Cats because she thought Cats was stupid. Right. That's the only way you're going to see Cats. Mm -hmm. So it becomes your definitive version. So don't put your actors in a place where they're going to suck. Yeah. So that's... We are 35 minutes into this. I know. I know. Like, I have a lot of feelings. Mm -hmm. So, any more about Bustopher Jones? Well, they do a bit where he's standing on a seesaw and another cat jumps down and is supposed to propel him upwards. Right. And he's too fat. And we have this like dialogue of like... Right, well, that's not going to work, is it? <laughs> that's what I say to you. <laughs> we get it. You're a cat. He also says... Because uh, I was coming back into the theater right mm. as this happened. Bring me more uh, cats. Like, like he forgot they were cats. Like... Like, they couldn't afford a take where his line reading mm-hmm. seemed certain that he was a cat. Yeah, this is going to, to come up later, but uh, it almost feels like instead of acting like a cat, he's playing, he's doing an impression of a cat. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, he, he's just, he's, he's not committed. To being a cat. Right. It's, just, it's more of like, look, I'm in a wacky cat costume. And that's how Rebel Wilson kind of feels, too. Yeah, and it's very infuriating. And plot-wise, it's important to note that McCavity, who is evil, and who yes. is Idris Elba, yes. wearing a cool coat and a cool hat, mm-hmm. uh, which is very important that he's wearing a cool coat and a cool hat, mm-hmm. he manages to uh, trap both Jenny Annie Dots and... Yes. Uh, Bust for Jones. He just kind of grabs Jenny on the dots, and then he tempts uh, James Corden's character into, like, jumping into trash. Yes. And it, like, sucks him away. Yeah, he gets, like, Veruca salted mm-hmm. down, like, the squirrel chute. Yeah, and I, I always want to call him Moriarty. Yes. Is that what he's supposed to be? <laughs> so, that was very astute of you. One, there is a visual sight gag. Where they call something Moriarty's. McCavity crosses in front of it and the text changes to McCavity. Oh, okay. And becomes a picture of McCavity. They also, uh, Taylor Swift's character calls him the Napoleon of Crime. Mm-hmm. Which is Moriarty's nickname in the Sherlock Holmes series. Okay. So, yes. Yay. <laughs> Good job. See? I'm not excluded. <laughs> yeah, I was, I, I was giving you the credit. Um, Who so, wants to exclude me? I'm not gonna be. So, uh, we have that that happens. Um, I want to I want to get through this. We have yeah. the Mungo Jerry and Rumple teaser sequence, which they clearly didn't really want to cut, mm-hmm. but also brings nothing to the plot. Um, yeah, it's just a sequence. Yeah, that looks that i think is intended to look cool and is intended to introduce scale because mungo yeah. jerry and rumple teaser are petty thieves right and they and victoria because mm-hmm. victoria is not in this number i showed you part of this number mm-hmm. while we while you were setting up the microphone uh so they and victoria are mm-hmm. robbing a house and playing and just laying waste to everything and doing like a number where they jump on the bed they do less gymnastics and less impressive choreography than the 1998 video, mm-hmm. which is weird. I'm going to rip this apart real quick. Okay, sure. Okay, so one, I feel like one of the reasons why they kept it is it's the only real duet. Yes, that's fair. Because like all of these are like, I'm a cat and this is about me. And this is the only one that we're cats and this is about us. Fair. Uh, two, like, this is like... There's some good visual stuff in here, mm-hmm. and, and 
but like we cut all over this like weird house and there's a bit where they're on a bed yeah and they jump up and like grab the headboard and then they fall backwards and i was like why is this familiar this is like a circus thing where they put a trampoline down and there's like a high box and you fall and you bounce up. Oh, yeah. They have one of those, like, the warrior gym. Yeah. And it's awesome. Like, and you, like, you jump up, you do a flip and all this other stuff. It's great because it's practical. This movie has so much god-awful wire work. Yes. Where, like, the cat jumps but doesn't really jump and then wires drag them along somewhere. Yeah, like, this is not Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Yeah. It's just, like, the wire work, it looks... Terrible. It looks like they're floating like Peter Pan, not cat jumping. And everything, like, pretty much everything is CGI. Nothing looks real. No. And, like, there are moments where the CGI it just isn't right. Mm-hmm. And the only thing I can compare it to is the way they make Miles Morales look in Spider-Verse. Okay. Where it doesn't look like they're rendering at the same frame rate as everything around them. Yeah, and like Miles is a very intentional choice mm-hmm. that's really cool. Yeah. This doesn't feel intentional. Because it's not always. It's just like they'll move a certain way and it'll just be like weird blur. Yeah. Ugh. Mm. I'm done ripping that part apart if you have anything to add about that part. So the end of it is... They're playing, and then they knock over a vase and upset the family dog, who we do not see, thank God, because I was not looking forward to crappy CGI dog. Yeah, understandable. And uh, Victoria gets trapped by the jewelry they've been putting on her. Mm -hmm. And they leave without her and leave her for dead. Yeah. And then Mistopheles comes to try to rescue her, but he gets stuck in a bunch of stuff? Because he's not very good at anything. No, he's bad at everything. And she eventually breaks herself free and, like, tries to save them. He pulls a bone out of his hat and distracts the dog. And then they kind of have, like, a weird almost kiss. Mm -hmm. And they look at each other. And then the dog starts to come back. And that's when they're like, oh, crap, we gotta leave. Yeah, They don't remove themselves from the danger. They're dumb. So he brings her back to the Jellicoe Ball. Which, instead of the iconic junkyard... From the musical is in the Egyptian a theater nightclub. Yeah, and I thought this was kind of fun because the Egyptians used worship to worship cats. cats, and I understand that this is now a change from the stage play. But I was like, oh, okay, I get it, cool, but whatever. It, it kind of works. It gives them stuff to play with. It's mm-hmm. fine. The, out of the things in the movie, them moving indoors is really like mm-hmm. the least of our problems. Old Deuteronomy shows up. Yes. She's Dame Judy Dench. Dame Judy Dench and her human hands. Yeah. We we saw the version where her hand... The hands got distracting after I knew to look at them. Yeah. Because everyone still got very human hands. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about overall character design later. And we see Grizabella for the first time. Yes. Who is played by Jennifer Hudson. Who it needs to be brought up... Has an Oscar. I yeah. believe Judy Dench does as well. Mm-hmm. Uh... Uh, Jennifer Hudson, so the song Grizabella the Glamour Cat is essentially just them bullying this poor old cat. And they add in that she used to go with Macavity. Right. That is also not in the musical. Oh. They, I guess, kind of lead you to Macavity has used and abused her and abandoned her. Okay. Because I don't know what's wrong with this cat and why everyone's so mean to her. Yeah, she's, like, she's a washed up like glamour cat Mm -hmm. she used to be beautiful she's aged out of being beautiful and instead of the other older cats we see who've aged into clearly other roles in their lives she's still mourning the times that have passed yeah this is where i notice that for some reason some of the scenes look like they're filmed by your jackass friend on his cell phone you didn't like the blair cat project it just kept shaking like like almost like an episode of uh, 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 arrested development but worse like just like when you're like all right i'm gonna hold this 
I know I can hold this steady. I don't need a tripod. And you just can't. And your hand just drifts naturally. It's Blair Witchy. Yeah, what? But with more CGI. What? There's so much CGI. You didn't have a tripod. Just hold the camera steady. What the hell are you guys doing? I legitimately wonder if this is one of the things that's going to be fixed in the new version. Um, mm. Obviously, we're not going to see it again before the podcast releases because I don't want to have to sit no. and watch this again I'm for a never while. This again. Oh, I'm I'm gonna have to. Uh, and they always, always have. Jennifer Hudson's nose disgustingly running. This is a Tom Hooper thing. He wants that graphic, uh, he wants that graphic emotion. So you love the do it bigger opening number of the Tonys. I do. And you know when Neil Patrick Harris goes, Oh, wait, oh, oh check this out. Uh, uh, can I have my uh, Tom Hooper lay miss close up, please? See, on Broadway, we don't need extreme close-ups to prove we're singing live. (laughs) We sing live eight shows a week. Check it. He's making fun of this shot and a lot of the shots in Les Mis. Right. Tom Hooper wants to prove his actors are singing live, so he gets real close in on them. See, what I took from this is... I know cats, like actual cats. Yes. That's nose are always like wet and runny. Mm-hmm. So it's just like, oh, this is a very cat thing to have that cat that always looks like it's crying and has like snot coming out of its nose. Mm-hmm. But why go there with this? It's unpleasant. That's kind of be like, oh, let's give them a real cat's experience and make the theater smell like piss. <laughs> it's it, it's attempting to show how much emotion she has, but it is incredibly distracting yeah. especially given how much cgi is in the movie I, I found myself being like was her nose actually running or did yeah. they, did Not they for add a second that do i believe it i think it's all cgi i was like did they add that in post why would you add that in po-? like i started to get distracted from the story and be like why would you add that in post? it's horrific it's gross nobody is nice to grizabella except for victoria yes because she's not part of the cult yet and she doesn't know better and that's mm-hmm. the impression you get like yeah. Everyone knows you're mean to her. Victoria, why aren't you mean to her? And then Victoria gets this very long, very long Taylor Swift song. So, let me just real quick tell you my experience with this. All the cats are gone. And Victoria starts singing this song about how she's haunted by, like, the past... And how she's now dancing with ghosts. And I was like, oh, we're really like, now we're breaking through. And instead of this being a cat auditioning to be the Jellicle choice, we're now getting into this character and how she like really feels and things like that. I'm invested. And I was kind of like a few like lyrics in. I was like, I think this might be the best song in the show. And then you lean over and go, this is the song they added. And I wanted to leave. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was like, you got to be kidding me. This is what I've enjoyed most. Um, so the meaning of the song is really interesting. Uh, Victoria is supposedly abandoned and she's much younger. Mm-hmm. She actually envies that Grizabella had good times. Because she's like, at least you have good memories. I have nothing. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of like... A weird kicking someone when they're down of like, oh, at least, you know, you have good memories. I have nothing. Feel sorry for me. Well, she doesn't sing it at Grizabella. Yeah, she kind of low-key does. I I thought this was... Grizabella leaves. Yeah, I thought this was just like, this is my damage. Yeah. I have damage too. This is me dealing with it. Unfortunately, it's a Tom Hooper musical number, which means they don't do anything interesting visually with it. No. It's just CGI Francesca Hayward singing. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing we missed, because I'm I'm trying to use the um, track listing, so anything that's not in the track listing, yes. I lose. And we're going fast, because we want to try to keep this under two hours. Yes. Um, so, they have, after Deuteronomy appears, they have the Jellicle Ball. Like, the part where they're dancing and having fun. Mm-hmm. I had fun during this part. It's yes. good choreography by good dancers, 
doing cool things. Yeah, I finally got to see Victoria be a ballerina. And I realized, I was like, oh, this is enjoyable because no one's trying to make a plot happen. Mm -hmm. It's literally just the dancing cats that we were promised. Yeah. So it's dancing cats. It's good. And then like once plot starts happening, I was like, and it's gone. (laughs) You know those shoe-wearing breakdancing cats show up again. Yeah, and you know what? It felt (laughs) less... are you? It felt less irritating to me that Mm. time because Mm. there were a bunch of little vignettes where people were doing different things. Uh, And it also should be noted that Sir Ian McKellen has shown up at this point. Yes, he's not doing anything quite yet. He's just kind of like in the background. There's this weird thing where we see all these cats dancing Mm -hmm. and they will then cut to either Judy Dench... Uh, Jennifer Hudson or Ian McKellen, uh, like, dancing as well, like, nearby. And then it'll be back to the group. Realistically, those three people were not in that room. Right. The eyes of these people, every time they cut to one of these three actors, is fear I'm not doing this correctly. Yeah. And, like, I kind of thought it was, like, trying to portray, like, these three don't fit in, and they're trying really hard to fit in. But it's not that. It's just them being like, all right, is this where I'm supposed to crawl on the ground? It's them looking at a director, like, is this what you want from me? Yeah. And, like, you can see it in their eyes. Yeah, and we also have established by this point, I believe, that McCavity has not murdered Jenny Any Dots or Buster Jones. Mm-hmm. They're on a boat? Yeah. They're on a boat. And they've chained them to the boat because the idea is if they're not there to compete, to compete, he'll win. Yes. McCavity wants to be taken to the Hepicide Lair. Yes. And then there's also the tiger that like has a weird song out of nowhere. He didn't have a whole song. He had a couple lines. Yeah, he had a lyric. Uh, Growl Tiger's last stand is a cut number. Growl Tiger is usually not a character who is... um, depicted quite the same way he was he's usually not a character who appears with McCavity. he's and the female cat who's also on the boat is intended to be griddlebone okay these characters usually only appear as a sequence in gus the theater cat with gus like having played growl tiger oh so it's this weird pirate sequence Okay. It's supposed to be like a production number that, if I am not mistaken, has been cut from most productions since the original. I know it didn't appear in the 2016 revival because it's a weird, and not in the 1998 film either. It's a weird, uh, it's like, it's a pirate song. Okay. So Growl Tiger is a sea captain who's driving the boat, who is extraneous in every way griddlebone mm-hmm. is not even named she is named she's mentioned in the song McCavity. okay so <laughs> like we haven't we haven't hit the parts that upset me the most yet yep just so you guys know we still got time uh, so the next thing we do is um gus the theater cat oh my god we we follow Mr. Molesticles, or whatever the fuck his name is. Mistopheles. Mistopheles. Oh, this bothered the crap out of me. This is such a theater thing that bothers the crap out of me. Yeah. What does Mistopheles say to Gus right before he goes on? Uh, it's almost time or something? No, he, he goes, your call. Good luck. Oh, that's a real good point. And Gus does not upbraid him for it. Mm -hmm. Gus does not chide him for it. And that is so in the face of what that character would do. Mm -hmm. And it, like, actually took me out of the moment. I was like, you can't tell me Ian McKellen didn't go. That's not a thing you say. (laughs) Ian McKellen has been doing theater for my lifetime and your lifetime put together. Oh, that didn't even dawn on me. Oh, it it actually took me out of the movie. Because I was like, no one ever looked at the script. Jesus Christ. what, What I'm seeing is... Sir Ian McKellen, Kandoff, Magneto, one of the, a knighted individual, one of, the, one of the greatest actors, licking milk out of a saucer. 
Yes. And I'm like, this dude, he doesn't realize what this movie is. And he's given it his all right now. Yeah, he is overcommitted to this. And like, the idea is he's the stage cat. He was in some shows. Gus the theater kid. Uh, <laughs> Gus the theater kid. Uh, his full name is Asparagus. Yeah. and But he's older, so like, he needs a little bit of help getting to the stage. Yeah. And he... His, like, performance here is, like, very moving. Yeah. Where it's like, I used to be so great. I'm no longer. I still like to talk about my time and still, like, want to contribute to the theater. and But, like, I'm doing my best. And then there's a shot over his shoulder where he's, like, almost about to cry. And behind him is the rail cat cleaning his shoes. Uh... And I'm like, Sir Ian McGowan is acting his fucking ass off right now what are you doing in this shot oh my god did no one see this i didn't even notice that oh because i was i thought it was a mistake because i was like who the hell is that and it wasn't until the rail cat comes out later that i was like oh i guess that was a setup for him showing up eventually oh but I this it. is stupid oh i didn't notice that oh that makes me so upset oh <laughs> so mad and Ian mckellen is like good He's he's trying so hard. Because then, sir, he finishes and all the cats enjoy it. And they and, applaud. And applaud. And Dame Judy Dench is like in this cat bed and likes it so much that she kicks her cat leg straight up in the air. Mm -hmm. Which is something Dame, Dame Judy Dench, I'm sure, physically can't do. Which means there is someone credited in this film as Judy Dench's legs. As her body double, yeah. <laughs> that is the person I want to talk to. <laughs> what was it like to be her legs? Oh boy. Ah, ah. I was wondering. I was wondering what you thought the worst thing ever had been. And that's, that makes a lot of sense. Oh. <sighs> Um, it did not occur to me. I thought, I was like, this, she probably she could lift her leg that much. It's not like a crazy, impressive motion. Uh, it just, it took me out of it. And then he gets kidnapped by McCafferty. Who, like, couches it as he wants an autograph. Mm -hmm. But it's McCafferty. He's bathed in red light. He's obviously evil. Yeah. Like, Gus is kind of stupid. Yeah, he's older. <laughs> And he was like, his flaw is his vanity, and I was like, okay, this is this is fine. But he ends up on the boat. Yes, he's on the old death boat. Yeah. Uh, more anger about this later. Okay. Uh, where are we going next? Skimbleshanks, the railway cat. Oh, uh, now this this is an excuse to have tap dancing. Yeah, I I kind of like this number. Yeah. It's fun and it's cute. Uh, here's the two takeaways that I am going to freak out about now. Okay. I mean, I'm exhausted talking about this film. Fair. Is he's the railway cat. You know, mm -hmm. the cat. On the railway train. On the rail train. And this is when I was like, oh, wait a minute. Are these all supposed to, like, represent different stereotypes of cat? What the hell's a railway cat? I mean, they would have cats on trains to have, uh, they didn't do the work Skimbleshanks does. Yeah, like, when I try to think of, like, okay, what are the different types of cat? Well, there's the lazy house cat. We kind of get that. We have the alley cat, which I don't know is maybe James Corden in this. And then you should have, like, the cat that's around to kill rats. That's never really addressed. And the bodega cat. Where is my bodega cat song? So... I mean, they would have had to add it because there was not a, like, bodega cats weren't a, um, a thing when T.S. Eliot was writing in the 1800s. Okay. Understood. Um, so, like, they were using these, you have to remind, you have to remember that this was, like, the 1800s. Gotcha. Okay. My apologies to T.S. Eliot. That little thing is not a problem. Yeah. Um, they would have had to add the book, but they added the... Breakdancing cats, so they, they could have... Yeah. Couldn't they have had, like, Lin-Manuel Miranda write a Bodega Cat song? I've liked like, 
He has a whole musical set around a bodega. He could write a song about a cat. Yeah, that'd be perfect. What a what? Lin Manuel Miranda should have been in this and fixed it. Uh, and they do this thing where he tap dances a train noise. Yeah, which is, is kind of cool. And he's tap dancing, and then all of a sudden they're on the train. And then, as he's like on the train and like they're dancing on the tracks. It slowly dissolves, and it's they had never left the Egyptian. They're still in the theater, and that was all a fantasy sequence. Why was that not happening the entire film? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I say when I say, like, musicals that are not ashamed to be musicals and are willing to, like... Uh, I Dreamed a Dream is one of the only sequences where Tom Hooper does it right in Les Mis, mm-hmm. where she's singing, and we also see things that are alluded to in the show... Like, we see Fontaine sell her hair. We see Mm -hmm. Fontaine sell everything she has, essentially. And we watch her decline through Mm -hmm. I Dreamed a Dream. Which is what a movie musical should do. Use the medium. You can do things on screen that you can't necessarily do on stage easily or, you know, financially feasibly. Mm -hmm. So this was a cute little sequence. I, I, it didn't make me angry. The actor who played Skimble Shanks, who I have to look up, Stephen McRae. Uh, Stephen McRae is a ballet dancer. He's had some other uh, credits, but he is primarily a dancer. Okay. All right. He was good. Yeah. But like, at this point, I'm so sick of this is my audition for the genical idol competition like i'm so, i don't want another like because i don't know any like all they say is this is what i do like yeah. you don't learn if any of these are like good cats yeah like, like, you, you don't, don't know anything about their morals <laughs> like why do i care about any of you yeah like they they don't deuteronomy says like she can see in a cat's soul but like so we don't learn anything about, like, whether they've ever done anything. It, yeah. It's, the plot sucks. Yeah. But good news, we're not going to see another audition song. We're going to see one character sing about another character. Yes. For the first time. We're going to see Taylor Swift. She is going to sing McCavity. Yes. We've waited all this time for Taylor Swift to return or to show up in this film because I knew she was in it and because I saw the scene where she like dumps a little bit of catnip out and there's not much more to her than that. She is only, I mean, she has a little dance. Mm -hmm. Um, There is more, not much. Yeah, it's her singing about McCavity, who is ostensibly her lover. So we finally get Taylor Swift and she sings McCavity and it's very strange because she got, like, really good reviews for this movie. Mm-hmm. A lot of people said she was the best part of this movie. I did not enjoy her performance in this film. I don't, I don't have much to say. Like, I'm the least angry about her. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of feel like she doesn't do very much. And, like, she tries to have a British accent. It's extremely inconsistent. Mm-hmm. Like, she has a British accent for about the first third of the song. Mm-hmm. And then it just kind of gets forgotten but the other noteworthy thing is Idris Elba takes off the coat and hat and it's horrifying yeah like he's a he's also a cat person because it I felt like he wanted or they wanted to show off how attractive he is Mm -hmm. so they wanted to show like his abs but there's a shot where you see a navel and that is... Oh, that is, is very weird. Oh, yeah. Oof. Uh, I screamed in the theater. <laughs> I was like, oh! I, I could not handle this. And he was like, uh, since I'm the only one left, I need to win. <laughs> and Deuteronomy's like, no, I will never choose you. I hate you. You're, you're a bad cat. Yeah, you're bad a, cat. You're a real bad cat. I don't, I don't like you. <laughs> so... He uh, magics her away, takes Taylor Swift with him. Mm-hmm. And through this whole sequence, Mungo Jerry and Rumple Teaser and Taylor Swift have been blasting everybody with catnip. Yeah. Which is, the effects of this are unclear. 
either they're brainwashed or they're having seizures or <laughs> I'm I'm genuine like I'm not trying to be glib. The, they they, they kind of act the way a cat acts on catnip, where they just kind of like lay on the ground and are like, oh. So they're just high. They're they're high, but like on Molly <laughs> or yeah, it's, ecstasy. It's where very like weird. Touching themselves feels especially good. Yeah, it's very uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> oh, you're about to hear a new level of anger. Believe it or not, we have a scene on this on the death boat. Damn boat. Where they're going to make Deuteronomy walk the plank. Walk the plank. Because cats hate water. And I was like, okay, I'm on board. Yep. Yep. So Something's got to happen. Well. This it, is the number where I turned to Noah and went, this oh, is the... Oh, before we even get to oh, Okay. It, we're still on the boat. Okay, still on the boat. It turns out Rebel Wilson... And James Gordon could have gotten out of their chains at any time. Yes. Because <laughs> they're like, oh, we could just get out of this. And Rebel, they just get out! Rebel Wilson does this twice during the show. I kind of burned this from my memory already. She takes off her cat Her shoot? body? <laughs> and is wearing, like, a sequined vest underneath? Yeah, like, she's wearing a cat suit that makes her look naked. And when she takes it off, she's actually wearing an outfit. And that lets her slip out of chains. Yeah, and it gives her enough room to get out. And with her out, Bustifer is able to get out. Yeah. So then she's And like, then they kind of help Skimbleshanks. Because Skimbleshanks is spirited away. Mm. He just flies in the air and explodes into glitter. Yeah. And then, like, we see Rebel Wilson, like, swinging chains like nunchucks. And she accidentally hits herself in the face. Hilarious! Don't mess with the crazy cat lady. Which, like, my aunt did, and we had to bring her to the hospital. So, there's, like, this fight scene. Then we we cut back to this uh, scene that breaks you. So, this is one of the iconic songs of the musical. This is one I made Noah watch. Yeah. Um, This is the song. You know it. You all know it. Mm -hmm. Magical Mr. Mistopheles. Oh, well, there never was a clever cat so magic as magical Mr. Mistopheles. Well, we certainly won't get a copyright strike for that. <laughs> Not because of your singing, just because the words were you, all wrong. you garbled the words pretty well. Um, so in this song, in the 1998 version, and in most versions, mm -hmm. it is sung by Rum Tum Tugger. Right. And he is singing about his admiration for this talented magician, mm -hmm. who everyone figures is going to be able to get Deuteronomy back. Yeah. Everyone believes in him. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh yeah, Mistopheles can bring him back. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. This Mistopheles is played by a talented dancer and a good actor, but he's playing him as a nervous seventh grade boy. Yeah. The music is almost unlistenable. They don't really even sing it. Like, they kind of, like, mumble through it because he's so unconfident. Mm-hmm. And, like, for the record, the plot here is as if the president was kidnapped. And we were like, oh, my God, we need to get the president back. Call David Copperfield. I mean, in, in this world, <laughs> magic is real. And also in this world... Is it? <laughs> I mean, McCavity uses magic pretty consistently. All right, yeah, that's true. So, instead of what happens in the um, in the musical is that he does some really fun, cute little things, and then he does a full on magic trick on stage where he has uh, one of the cats volunteer, and she goes under a blanket, and he says like presto, mm -hmm. takes the blanket off, and Deuteronomy is there. Right. In this one, he fails several times, mm -hmm. and it's just awkward. And every time they fail, they stop singing for a moment. The most iconic song, in my opinion, from Cats. They just, like, give up on. Yeah, like, the song never hits the energy level 
it hits in the musical. Not even close. It's not a celebration the way it is in the musical. Mm. It is awkwardly trying to get this young cat to struggle bus his way to victory. Yeah. And in the end, it looks like he failed, but Judy Dench comes in behind. Yeah. And sings, and they're all like, oh, she's back, hooray! Yeah. Mr. Mistopheles did it, maybe. Yeah, like, it's... <laughs> or Deuteronomy escaped, possibly. Yeah, it literally... I, I mean, when I turned you in, this is the number that's gonna break me. Mm -hmm. It's because, one, they made it, like, three times longer. Yeah. Well, not three times. They made it much longer. And slower, and... Oh, it's just... It it's... felt three times longer. And again, they shoehorn in Victoria. Mm -hmm. Like, she gets a solo during it, that she believes in him, and then they, like, nuzzle, which I think is how this movie is presenting kissing. Yeah, because they're cats. But, like, every everybody's nuzzling each other, so I'm not really sure. They're, they're clearly trying to sell us a romance between Mistopheles and Victoria, mm -hmm. but since they can't use human physicality, it's just weird, and we don't really get it. Yeah. So we cut back to the boat. Which, I forgot this damn part, but mm -hmm. James Corden hacks up a hairball and hits someone in the face. Oh, yeah, I kind of just... It's like the hackiest cat jokes you can think of. Yeah. And then, once they realize Deuteronomy has escaped and is saved, there's a moment where Sir Ian McKellen is, like, having an emotional reaction to this. Mm-hmm. That, like, Deuteronomy, someone that they ca that he cares about deeply, is safe. And he's in the foreground, like, looking kind of like, oh, good, this is good. There's a little bit of sadness because now he's not going to be there to be the gen the jellical choice. Like, he's conveying so much with mm -hmm. his face and half of it's CGI. And in the background, James Corden and Rebel Wilson are just rubbing their paws together. Yeah, they're doing, like... When you joke about kids fighting, like the kids fighting in the back seat, I, what the what's happening here is Sir Ian McKellen is in a shit movie acting his ass off, yes, trying to convey all these intense emotions, and Rebel Wilson and James Corden drew cat in a game of charades, yeah, and that is the best they can do. Yeah, like this is maximum anchor. I know, but it's also, like, a little late, and we have neighbors. Uh. Um, this is... Ian McKellen does too good of a job in this movie. I, I would argue several actors do too good of a job in this movie for this movie. Mm -hmm. um, next is Jennifer Hudson, who emotes the living crap out of memory. Yeah. It's um, a good song. So Victoria goes outside and sings a prologue to memory... To lure Grizabella in. She wants Grizabella to come in mm -hmm. and state her case to be the Jellicle choice. Mm -hmm. So she kind of like lures Grizabella in. They've had this moment of connection through beautiful ghosts and the other Grizabella number. Mm -hmm. And then she sings the beginning of memory. And then Grizabella sings memory. And then she like falls to the ground crying. And then Victoria, who we cannot go... Three seconds without paying attention to Victoria, uh, sings part of the song that's not her part to sing to like encourage Grizabella to move mm on. Mm -hmm. Ugh. The the song "Memories" sounds like it is being sung by an incel. <laughs> okay, touch me. It's so easy to leave me. If you touch me, you'll know what happiness is. Okay, that's a that's a fair assessment. Um, <laughs> it's it sounds like it's it's a very nice song, nice meeting. But if you sing it from the point of view of a guy who thinks his dick is God's gift to women, <laughs> it has an entirely different meaning. Now, memory is an interesting case because it's the only song based on not. It's the only song that's in the musical that's not directly based on something from Old Possum's book. Oh. It's based on another T.S. Eliot poem. Oh. Uh, Rhapsody on a Windy Night, and there's been a lot of lyrical changes to make it fit. There's, like, 30 freaking versions of memory with, like, huh. different verses and different refrains. And 
this one seems to use all of them. Like, there's a bunch where I'm like, I feel like we're using all of these. Interesting. So, they they have to change some of it to fit the meter of the song. Mm -hmm. So, like, when they were writing the musical, they changed a bunch of stuff. And it's a little bit like, On My Own has a couple different versions. There's certain songs that have been changed up and adapted over time. And that's one of them. So Grizabella sings Memory. It's very emotional. It has the Tom Hooper problem Mm -hmm. of the actor is crying so much and emoting so hard, the music is no longer very pretty. Yeah. Like, the movie soundtrack is not the definitive version I would use for anything. Yeah. Deuteronomy approaches Grizabella and says very tenderly, you are the Jellicle choice. Mm Mm-hmm. And they lead Grizabella to a chandelier that Mistopheles, like, lights the candles on. And then it begins to ascend out of the theater. Yes. Up to the heaviside lair. Mm-hmm. So it begins to ascend. And then there's, like, a ribbon or a rope hanging from it. hmm And McCavity tries to hang on to it. hmm And then he falls off it and falls onto a statue. He's fine. Yeah. But the last we see of him is him upset, bemoaning his fate. Yes. That he didn't get, he doesn't get to ascend. Well, he also then tries to magic himself away and cannot. So he's lost his magic as well. And then he tries to like get down and the way the statue is slippery, he can't. So we're supposed to be like, oh, he's stuck up there. Yeah. Okay. And we know. I guess that's punishment. And we have no idea where Bombay Arena Taylor Swift is. Yeah. She is on the danger boat, gets magicked away with McCavity off the danger boat, mm-hmm. and then never appears again. Yeah. So then there's like a little short number while they're putting Grizabella in the uh, ascension balloon, mm-hmm. where they sing like, up to the heaviside lair, yay! There's all these little character moments where, you know, Victoria and Mistopheles nuzzle again. And everybody's just kind of doing stuff, and she ascends, McCavity's bit. And then we have the ending. The oh ending is, the addressing of cats is in the musical. But I, it feels so long and awkward in this movie. It doesn't work. It's not how the movie should have ended. Yeah. So first off, this is delivered to camera. Oh yeah, Judy Dench... Full on looks into your soul. Yeah, so like after spending two hours getting used to the horrors that is the CGI, it then addresses you directly. And it is horrifying. Oh my god, it's it's bad. Uh you legitimately went ah! Yeah. <laughs> I actually said no. <laughs> I was like, stop. And I was like, okay. This is this is supposed to be like the wrap up. This is clearly the end of the movie, mm-hmm. and it's like insane to me to end a musical on one person just singing rather than a big extravaganza musical number. Yeah, and they're sitting on the statue of a lion because it's a big. It's cat. the lion in Trafalgar Square. It is an iconic London landmark. I know, but like, there's tons of landmarks in london they chose the one that was a cat yes that is true uh and basically she says when addressing a cat know that they are not a dog i knew that line was coming and admittedly looked at you when that which you should have known something bad was about to happen because if i'm looking at you during the movie I'm looking to see what you do. Like, we spent two hours here. Is that what the message? It was that cats are different than dogs? I legitimately watched are you they, die a little inside. Are they afraid we didn't know that? If we're not supposed to be addressing dogs, what was with the goddamn canine pun at the beginning of the film? <laughs> I've never seen you this mad. About I'm not allowed anything. to yell anymore. Yes, I just I don't I don't wanna mm. wake the neighbors. Um this also just, it's so long. It's so awkward. It's not staged beautifully. Yeah. It's just not staged, really. And at the end, like, on top of the line, everyone's in front of the line, including Jason Derulo, who is a sport. <laughs> um, and Well, everyone's in this one. Rebel Wilson, James Corden, oh. Jason Derulo. 
Uh, I can't remember. Ian, yeah, no, Ian McKellen's in it. Because there was one point where I was like, how's he doing what little choreography there is here? But on top of it is Deuteronomy, mm-hmm. um, Mistopheles, Monka Strap, and Victoria. Mm-hmm. And then Dawn is broken. The cats all scatter. Except for Victoria and Deuteronomy. Like, mm-hmm. we have, like, a nice end note. And I'm like, okay, we're done. Mm-hmm. And we actually see the uh, balloon... Fade into sunlight. Fade into sunlight. <laughs> and then, like, Deuteronomy consoles Victoria that she is a jellical cat. Mm-hmm. And that's the end of the movie. Yeah. And, like, th- this is something else I notice in this. I- I'm desperately trying to make myself continue to pay attention. Mm-hmm. And what I decide I'm going to do is I'm going to play Guess the Rhyme. Okay. So at one point, the line ends with the word habitat. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, tabby cat. And it's not. It's just cat. Yep. And I'm like, why not just try a little harder with these lyrics? And I understand now that it's T.S. Eliot. Yeah. So it was just like a poem. But it's just not good in any way nope i mean this is a tough thing so this is the the black box section of this where we like talk about the research the history the hype and the aftermath um so they made a few very weird choices with this Mm -hmm. the character's design is very uncomfortable and very weird everything with their like fur technology Mm -hmm. making everything very form-fitting Makes everything seem very creepy. Yes. In a way that, like, the thick leotards that the dancers wear doesn't make it feel. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, I never feel like we're watching someone be super naked when we watched the the pieces from the 1998 film. Nobody looks fluffy. Yeah, like, all the cats are very, like, nobody has any, like, fur. Everyone has that very slim cat head. Mm Mm-hmm. Cat's heads are not that shape. No. But they have human hands. Yeah. And I think it would have been easier to almost leave the actor's actual hair intact Mm -hmm. and have them just be like cat people. Yeah. Like, you know, Bumbalurina just has Taylor Swift's blonde hair. Mm -hmm. Maybe digitally tinted to be the color you want it to be for Bumbalurina. Mm -hmm. Maybe like give her an reddish orange hair. Because she's a reddish orange cat. Mm-hmm. But kind of like keep that feature. And it might have made everyone look a little less weird and creepy. Yeah, I mean, like they do a good job with the ears showing emotion. Yes, they do. Uh, and, uh, and like it's well, that part is well done. But like. The tails are creepy. Tail, yeah, the tails are very weird. Uh, ugh. I'm trying to think of what else I wanted to really talk about. Uh, They spent $100 million on this movie, which is an astronomical sum for a musical. Mm -hmm. This is also a musical that debuted uh, nearly 40 years ago. Yeah. This musical debuted in 1982. I believe there is such thing as waiting too long Mm -hmm. to adapt a property. Uh, The videotape came out in 98. And... That's about an appropriate amount of time. The show has been running. It's been touring. You're not going to make... Anyone who's going to buy the video was not going to buy tickets to Cats or was going to buy tickets to Cats and will still do so. So you're not really losing money putting out the video at that point. Right. I think waiting nearly 40 years to put out a film adaptation, uh, Cats isn't a public household name anymore. No, not not really. Like, when's the last time a pop culture reference? It's better than cats. Uh, I can't say I've ever heard that. <laughs> it, it used to be a joke in the nineties. Okay, I've heard it on things that were set in the nineties. Now, if you're using a cultural touchstone of a musical, someone is either bringing up Hamilton or Wicked, depending oh. on the time period that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. It's Hamilton or Wicked, and. I wanted to to bring this up because this was something that we thought about. Uh, What what year did Cats debut? 82. 82. Okay. Uh, So when you get into theater, you're usually like, like 
enough to like go see a Broadway play or get like into stuff like that, you're usually like mid teens, something like that. Yeah, by the time like a lot of people's parents are willing to take them to Broadway, mm-hmm. they're you know, maybe younger, mid teens. Yeah. So I was thinking like if you were you know, a mid teen in eighty two and like so and catch was your thing here 40 years later you would probably be interested in seeing cats the movie Mm -hmm. if you were a mid-teen in 82 that means that you were like eight or nine when empire strikes back came out yeah and they put it out against Star Wars. That was actually going to be a thing. I said uh, they released it against the second most anticipated film of this year. Because uh, the first is indisputably Endgame. Right. But I would say Rise of Skywalker is probably the second most anticipated film this year. Yeah. And they released Cats against it. And I they usually do what's called counter-programming. Mm-hmm. But the Venn diagram of theater nerds and... Star Wars nerds is much closer to being a circle than a lot of people think. Yeah. There have been multiple theatrical Star Wars, uh, like, shows. Mm-hmm. There have been multiple parody musicals. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know one quite well. Yeah. Um, so there, there have been multiple Star Wars th- stage theatrical endeavors. Mm-hmm. So that Venn diagram is much closer to a circle than you think. Yeah. They were trying to run it as, because it's a musical, they were trying to run it as female-centric counter-programming, forgetting that generationally, Star Wars is much less male-dominated than it would have been in the 70s and 80s. A lot of women are into Star Wars now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Look around our home. Yes. So it's not really effective counter... And usually, a counter-programming film is fairly inexpensive. Think like Sisters, the Amy Poehler movie that came out against Last Jedi. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, it's usually a less expensive film that's going to have to do way less work to earn its money back. Yeah. Katz's budget was $100 million before marketing Mm -hmm. and before what happened today. Before this alternate release. Right. Where they've had to digitally fix stuff because Tom Tom Hooper admitted openly Mm -hmm. that the movie was not completed until Monday of this week. Mm Mm-hmm. And the uh, premiere was on Tuesday. That's insanity. So they released an unfinished film, essentially. Has this ever happened before? So there's one movie I can think of that was pulled from theaters, but it was running in a much, much more limited scale. Okay. To be released, fixed, and re-released. Um, and it's Watcher in the Woods, which let me look up the release here on. Because I, I just had a thought, and it'd be a really interesting coincidence if it was... Okay, it was 1980. I kind of thought it might have been... The same year. 1982, that and would that would have been, been super, super interesting. So they, they had to release another version with fixes? Yes. They pulled Watcher from the Woods from release because it was, like, essentially unfinished. Mm-hmm. So the movie was released in 1980 and only in New York. Okay. So it was only running in one city, and it was pulled from theaters because the audience was like, this movie's terrible, and they fixed it. Interesting. Because they had to fix the ending because it didn't make any sense. Okay. So they made it a little bit more... They ratcheted it up. It was a kid's scary movie. Mm-hmm. It's a Disney movie. And so they made it a little more tense and a little more scary, but then they kind of explained the ending a little better. Okay. And fixed the ending so that the plot made sense, and then re-released it, and it did all right. Uh, I've been racking my brain trying to think if there was ever a time where a uh, a director has come out and said, no, this wasn't my vision, it wasn't fixed, and then fixed it. And I can think of another one, and it's Star Wars. That's true. <laughs> Um, I can actually think of a few where things changed. E.T. Uh, E.T. Well, E.T., that one's that one's actually infamous for how ridiculous mm-hmm. it is. Uh, Beauty and the Beast. Oh, yeah. They cut a number called Human Again, 
And then once Beauty and the Beast was ridiculously successful and had a ridiculously successful Broadway musical attached to it, they finished the animation for Human Again, edited it back into the film, and re-released the film. The difference being this was about 10 to 12 years later. Yeah, this is the only time in 40 years where it's been a week later they're like, yo, we had to fix some stuff. Technically only three days. Three days, It would have come out Thursday night with Star Wars. Mm -hmm. The re-release was being sent Sunday morning. Because, like, I believe we saw the unedited, the unfixed version. We must have. Because we saw Judi Dench's wedding ring and her hands. Yeah. But, like, I can't... That's not enough to fix this movie. No. (laughs) Like, it's not like the director saw that and was like, this isn't my vision. (laughs) The hand should be more Paul-like. It was rough. Uh, Also, from what I understand, the song Beautiful Ghosts was supposed to be, whenever you do a musical, there is always a song that is added in or plays over the credits Mm -hmm. because in musicals, the songs that exist already are not eligible for Oscars. Right. So Phantom of the Opera, all I ask of you could not win an Oscar. Mm -hmm. So they recorded a new song called Listen. The songs are very often not great. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's just the way it is. But this one's actually decent. Uh, Which is a shame because from what I understand, it's nominated for a Golden Globe but did not make the Oscar shortlist. Interesting. Which is kind of interesting because this was like their only only shot of winning an Oscar for this film. Yeah. Well, Ian McKellen <laughs> he does really well. Maybe they'll win for CGI. The film is weird and uncomfortable and unsettling. It feels very long. It's not quite two hours, but it feels very long. Uh, I'm sure there's things that I noticed that upset me at the time that we didn't have time to go over or mm-hmm. I didn't get to think about. Mm-hmm. Um, oof. I I was really happy. To see it in theaters and see the unedited version, though. Yeah. Because there's a really big part of me that feels like I'm going to have seen one of the all-time great flops. Oh, yeah. Like, there are going to be books written about this. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. We may write them. Yeah, like, this might be the 2010s The Room or the 2010s Rocky Horror. Yeah, and... I actually thought about Rocky Horror a lot because this almost at times felt like an unaware Rocky Horror. Yeah. Where, like, they didn't, like, you gotta see what you're making, guys. Like, you, why is this like this? And it ends with them going up in the sky. <laughs> it also, Rocky Horror has a very juvenile approach to sex. Um, it's also like, I'm thinking about it this way, because I was 12 or 13 the first time I saw Rocky Horror. Right. It was a big part of my teenage years. My mother bought me a Columbia costume, because my parents made some mistakes. Um, so, in my mind, Rocky Horror is very tied to adolescence. Yeah. And it has aged horribly. There's a lot of, like, consent problems, obviously a lot of transphobia, yeah. Uh, I didn't see the remake with Laverne Cox, so I can't really vouch for how that addressed anything. So yeah. I'm only talking about the Tim Curry version. And it ages very poorly. Yeah. I think the awkward sexuality of this movie is going to be something that teens in 10, 15 years discover and the internet's going to get a hold of it mm-hmm. and it's going to be a whole thing. So there's going to be a part of me that's like, I saw it when it mm. first ran. No, I didn't think it was good either. Don't mm. put that evil on me. Um, but I felt like I got to see a piece of film history in a way that like, I don't feel like I've ever gotten to do in this way. Yeah. Like I felt that way with like Endgame. Like, oh, we saw Endgame on the opening yes. night. Yeah. Or when we saw Avengers before it opened. Oh, that, and we actually saw the first run with the shawarma scene. Yeah. Because it didn't run in the premiere. Mm-hmm. So that we saw the feel f- special the first night they aired the shawarma scene. Mm-hmm. We saw it on like the Wednesday before it premiered yep. because they were so confident in Avengers they had 
pre-screenings, mm-hmm. which I, I can't fathom them doing now with stuff like Don't Spoil the End Game. Yeah. So. But it was cool in yeah, a way. It, like, we, we rushed out to see it because we wanted to be part of the conversation. Yes. And also, we do this show. So, that brings us to the title of this show. This one needs a verdict. Oh, absolutely stay doomed. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Good God. <sighs> so listen, guys. I've been very angry this entire time. Uh, but I had every intention to give this a stay tuned. Because I've been calling this, this movie, uh, Sushi at a Steakhouse. Okay. If you made the best sushi in the world and tried to sell it at a really good steakhouse, it would bomb horribly because who wants sushi at a steakhouse? Okay. I went into this like not a Cats fan. And when I saw the the trailer, I was like, ooh, this isn't for me. But who am I to say what a good Cats movie looks like? If you're a fan of Cats... You'll probably like this. That's not true. If you're a fan of cats, this isn't a cats movie. It's wrong. Yep. It's just wrong. So it's not even good for that audience. And then I was like, okay, it's for furries. It's really not. No. (laughs) It's not even for good for furries. No. When the first trailer dropped, uh, people kept making furry jokes and... Several people in the furry community were like, we don't want it. No. Don't put this evil on us. Yeah, we're excited for Sonic. This is not good for anyone. No, it's not a good musical. It's not a good adaptation of Cats. Like, I showed you... a movie? I showed you two or three numbers from the 1998 Cats. Hmm. What did you think comparing the two? I, I can't believe how much energy Mr. Mistopheles has. Mm Mm-hmm. Because, like, he's so unsure of himself this entire movie. And he's doing unbelievable things in the stage show. Yeah. And, like, one of the amazing things about this as a stage show is it takes a lot of talent and a lot of work to do the things that are done in that show. Yes. And for this, it's just really bad wire rope and CGI. Yeah, it's not... It's not... Even as good as a version made 20 years ago. Yeah. With considerably less money and considerably more limitations. Also, nobody is going to see Cats because they want to see how they make the actors look like actual cats. Yeah, nobody's asking, (laughs) like... No one's leaving cats like I was on board, except the costumes didn't make them look like real cats. Yeah, people are willing to suspend disbelief a certain amount, especially in musical theater. Yeah. Uh, It's a medium where people are like, yeah, I'll believe this is happening. Like, it's just bad. Yeah, like, think about a movie going audience. You can give an audience a Muppet movie. Yeah. And they are on board. They're like, yep, Kermit the Frog is the main character of this movie. Um, Muppet Christmas Carol. You know, you have Michael Caine, mm-hmm. who fully commits to Kermit the Frog is another actor in this film mm-hmm. and will be treated as such. The audience goes with it. Everybody goes with it. I think it's also important to mention how much of the cats are CGI. So the actors have no idea what they're actually going to look like. Yeah. I would pay American dollars to watch a reaction video of any of those actors I, I might, seeing the trailer for the first time. I also time. might buy the DVD just so I can see it before CGI and like behind the scenes. Uh, I'm probably going to buy the DVD because I'm planning to use this movie right. academically. I also think, and this is already going way over time for an episode, but... It's very interesting that they paired the Sonic trailer with it because of the Sonic backlash of, like, they tried to make a realistic-looking Sonic, and the fans were like, we don't want that. Just give us a cartoony Sonic that we love. And the Cat movie was like, we're going to give you realistic-looking cat people. And nobody wanted that. Oh, it was so bad. Uh, yep. It's unbelievable. It really is. I, I can't believe what we went through. 
It was <laughs> to get us here. It was very interesting. Uh, we were in a theater with a family who I, I'm guessing the daughter was a Taylor Swift fan mm-hmm. because, like, the parents. She was about the right age to be, like, Taylor's main demographic. And it was parents. There was a couple who I think might have been able to see, trying to see it in earnest. Yeah. Uh, There were four kids in the back that really sold me on the, this is the new Rocky Horror. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Because they were, there's one point where everyone's reaching out to the everlasting cat. And these guys were in. They were all reaching towards the screen. And I laughed so hard. I remember the big point I wanted to make about the biggest problem with this. Okay. I talked about fan fiction. Victoria is made into every 13-year-old girl's self-insert Mary Sue. Mm. She is in every scene. She is key to the plot. She's Mistopheles' girlfriend. She gets Grizabella to come in. Yeah. Mistopheles has always been a fan favorite. Mm -hmm. Um, Deuteronomy recognizes her personally multiple times. Uh, The leader, Monkastrap... Also seems to be into her. McCavity seems to be kind of into her. Yeah. She is the most desirable cat. She's pure. She's innocent. She doesn't want any of this attention, but she's, of course, going to accept all this attention. And she's somehow special despite having no actual qualities. Yeah. She is a Mary Sue. Yeah. That's very well put. She doesn't really have any personality traits on her own. Um, She's not even like... She's an incredible dancer, but we don't really get to see enough of her dancing, weirdly, in this film. No. Because we, we don't. constantly kind of get her taken away because she's dancing in the middle of what's supposed to be the action. Yeah. So she is really a Mary Sue. And the fact is, she's not written in the play that way. So she's there to give us an audience surrogate. Yeah. But it feels like it, it hits all the boxes of the Mary Sue. She's beautiful. She has a tragic past. She instantly seems to connect with everybody. Mungo, Jerry, and Rumpelteaser let her rob a house with them. Yeah. Uh, And of course they like leave her to take all the blame because it's not entirely unrealistic. But like, for some reason, this innocent cat is everybody's favorite. She's one of the four left on top of the building at the end. Mm -hmm. And it's such a weird... I mean, she's barely in the show. Mm-hmm. She is the Bella Swan of cats. Yes. She is there for the target demographic of very young teenage girls to project themselves onto. Mm-hmm. And that is the reason I really couldn't stand what they did with that character. They also made Mistopheles this, like, kind of awkward teenage boy character. When yeah. in the musical, he is so much more charismatic and so much more confident. Mm-hmm. And someone's like, bring Deuteronomy back. And he's like, presto, I yeah. can do this. Oh, So, so it fails as an adaptation. It fails as a film. Mm-hmm. It fails as bait for de- different demographics. Yeah, it fails. It just, it, it it's a hard fails. stay doomed. Oh. <sighs> so I guess <laughs> next week we'll watch The Nanny. Sure. Um, unless you want to do a Star Wars episode. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to go to bed. <laughs> we'll decide this later. Okay. Where could people find us, Laura? You can email us at the stay doomed show at gmail.com or on Facebook and Twitter at stay doomed. Well, what if people want to see us like live? You can see us January 2nd through 5th in National Harbor, Maryland at MAGFest. And if you play Dame Judy Dench's legs... On that TV's Noah. If you also owned the VHS of Cats from 1998, I'm at Priorities. Until next time, stay doomed.